quick uh, for anyone who's just joining us. Uh, this is the Silm Film Project script discussion, uh, season one, episode three. Um, I figure I'm gonna I'm gonna say this every twenty minutes or so, so that when I break it up into pieces, there's an introduction at the beginning of each of them. Ha <laughs> ha! Thinking things through. Okay. Um, so right now, what we're doing is we're uh, we're discussing the episode that's going to concern the, the origin of Melkor. Um, I feel like if we've nailed down Estelle's reaction at this point, I feel like we've kind of nailed down the frame. Do we agree? Except and for we, the end of the frame, yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. But we're we're yeah. Gonna, but yeah we can get the beginning and middle of the frame sounds good to me. Okay. Cool. Okay. So. All right. So I listened to the the podcast uh, concerning this episode, and. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you sound so excited about that. You're like, so I listened to the podcast, um, and it, I, I swear you, it's going to get better. Good, it's huh? going to get easier. Um, yes, uh, <laughs> Riso Fidelis, uh, episodes one and two are online, available to to watch. Uh, you can actually get episode two on YouTube, but it is two and a half hours long. Episode one is over four hours long, so have fun with that. Yay. <laughs> um, like That's a ringing endorsement. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like, like I was saying, my plan for this episode is to break it up into 20 minute or so chunks on YouTube so that people from the forums can watch them, so that we can go back and reference them without it be, having to find a piece of information in the middle of a four hour long episode. Okay. True. All right. So yeah, my hope is that uh, the extremely long episodes for the very unlikely possibility that someone will come to this before they read the Silmarillion, mm -hmm. they'll read the Silmarillion and you're like, wow, it's so coherent and so easy after, you know, our meanderings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, let's, let's, uh, let's kind of dive into the story now. Um, where, where are we okay. starting? We're starting in the Timeless Hall um, after, well, before the music. Yes, we right. should start even earlier than we started before because the Timeless Halls before we started with Nienna singing. Right. So, like, there's already a lot of Valar created. There's stuff there. Melkor's, like, you know, the first. Yeah, well, yeah, he's one of the two first that we, that we see. Right. Um, so... Melkor could be in the Timeless Halls before there's any other Ionar there. Ionar, however you say this. but um, So we could see him be, like, seeing the others created. Like, the others are new, and he's the guy who already knows what's going on. Right. Which gives him, like, a big brother superiority thing. Yeah. That seems totally justifiable at first. Okay. <laughs> You know, like the oh well, you're new here and don't know how this works, but let me let me set you straight and okay. you know, like that kind of attitude. How does it work? How does what work? Well, you said that he's explaining to the newer Ionor how, how you know this is how it works here. How how does yeah. it work? Like oh, what? I have no idea. Well, that, <laughs> that's the problem. The is that we, are like. Completely nebulous. Like, do they even? I mean, they're halls. Do they have buildings, or is it just like blank space? I, I feel I, like we're going to need to show some sort of structure, structure as as a metaphor for what's yeah. actually there. You know, I would hope so. Yeah, we'll do the set guys a solid by giving them something to yeah. work with. Maybe um, there was. A, this, it's hard to make blank. Yeah. yeah, there was a mention on the discussion boards that for Utumno, Melkor would be trying to mimic the Timeless yeah. Halls. Mm -hmm. So we never did figure out what Timeless Halls yeah. look like, but if he's going to be mimicking them, then yep. there could be some kind of dome thing going on with the pillars that we could then well, reflect in his design. Well, I could I can imagine that the Timeless Halls are infinite or appear infinitely huge 
So basically, like if you remember in um, in Fellowship of the Ring, the Fellowship of the Ring film, when they went, when they when they they do the big reveal of the the dwarf city of Dwarodelf, and you know Gandalf lights up his staff even brighter, and you see these pillars that just go on forever. Um, uh, yeah. I feel like it should be something like that. When we look off into the distance, we should just see yeah. these almost, I mean, they, you know, they're semi-solid pillars that go off virtually forever. Um, the yeah. host did discuss a conversation that um, Melkor has with Varda on the edge of the timeless falls, looking out into the void. Um, mm -hmm. so that would probably be the only time where we would see the edge of the structure. Yeah. The structure. Yeah, I don't have any coherent thoughts at the moment about that particular scene. Mm -hmm. But I do know that uh, one of the thoughts that I had when thinking about this, what would the set look like? Like and mm -hmm. what would Melkor's imitation of it look like? Just imagining if he thinks of if there are archways in the Timeless Hall, I'll have more archways. Yeah. You can yeah. never have too many archways. Like if there are pillars, I'll make more pillars, yeah. bigger, bigger pi pillars. <laughs> <I'm> just <laughs> right. Yes, everything yeah, I'm, I'm bigger because always better, and it sort of loses its beauty from being too much because mm -hmm. that kind of. I, I like that for him. Yeah, more <laughs> is not really better. Much yeah. Yes, more is not always more. Um, right. The idea of them looking out into the void or the gray nothingness works in terms of if you're imagining artists drawing a scene or people trying to put together a set that would be doable and that yeah. would make sense just symbolically also to an audience watching it of, right. oh, here is where Luvatar is and there's order and there's structure mm -hmm. and there's form and then everything beyond it is gray, Nothing. misty and shapeless. So visually it works. Right. Okay. So do we do we, so we have to kind of as a frame of reference we have to kind of go back to the timeless halls to start with yeah um mm -hmm. but we also have to establish that yes. melkor leaving them to go out into the void by himself mm -hmm. okay um so the question becomes how, and we're gonna have to do those two things relatively quickly um yeah so how does that happen? Um, he can kind of seem like he's very comfortable in the timeless halls when there's nobody there. And then as soon as people start being there, he gets okay. a little bit uncomfortable. Like, what are all these people doing here? This isn't my thing. And then right. just okay. walks through the archway into the nothingness or whatever. So do we kind uh, of go back yeah. to the pre-music singing where we start to, you know, as he's, um, as he's, you know, moving through the halls and, and, and we start to hear, we start to hear the, you know, the ones and twos and threes singing and yes. he's just kind of like, mm, mm -hmm. that's not the way I do it, you know, um, cause he has no control over them. Yeah, that's that's why I, I feel he would be frustrated by others because these are others who don't listen to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything that's different from him or isn't quite the way he would do it would be frustrating to him. Um, I imagine. Right. He doesn't have that love of variety or the love of otherness um, right. so, that the others so, seem to have. Right. Yeah. So he could come up with to a group of two or three who are like trying to sing together or do whatever it is they're doing musically. Okay. And he can try and like take over their little thing and be like, no, 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 no. See, this is, this is how you're supposed to do it. And when he does that, <laughs> they just stop. Like what, you know, they're confused and therefore they, they're quiet. And 
and therefore it doesn't work. Yeah, they, they weren't his people, yeah. you know. So it, it just it, yeah. Eh. He wouldn't take failure very well either. Mm. Yeah, and if we see Melkor trying to interact and it failing in some way due to his own fault, probably, but still seeing him then withdraw, it, it does set him up to be kind of a, a sympathetic character to anyone watching mm -hmm. for who has ever been at a party or mixing with people and then realize that mm -hmm. what they're trying to do isn't working. Right. And that they're very much mm -hmm. the odd one out and they kind of back through the doorway or wander into the kitchen or wherever there's fewer people well, or, and uh, or get or a drink or something. When it's their party. You know, which to him it is, <laughs> and he yeah. all of a sudden discovers that he's the awkward one, he's the odd one out, and so that kind of accentuates yeah. that feeling. You know, because this was supposed to be his thing, like like everybody should be looking yeah. up to him because he's the eldest, right? So maybe yeah. his first interaction goes well. Maybe like he meets the Balrogs first. Okay. And and they're all like, yeah, yep. you're awesome. And he he tries to teach them a song. They're like, we're playing that song, and and they immediately right. take his lead. So he's like, all right, I got this, I got this. Goes to the next group and tries the same thing, and they're all like, and it does you not work. Work. yeah, right. Yeah. And so and that's like, his so attitude would shift towards, oh, I don't like this at all. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and so you know we start to see him moving out into moving out into the void. Mm -hmm. Um, he's looking for the flame imperishable. Yeah, I don't know how we bring that up. That, yeah, I was yeah. just wondering that myself. All right, so I was hoping you guys had ideas. I mean, <laughs> again, it, the the easy way to kind of set it up in my mind is for how it, um, yeah, is to have him wondering is to have him have a conversation with Iluvatar to start out with. Um, to have him asking Iluvatar what it is, you know, how, how he's doing this, how he's making these people and have Iluvatar explain about the flame imperishable. But again, I don't feel entire, um, entirely comfortable um, putting words in Iluvatar's uh, mouth that Tolkien didn't put there. You know, like we discussed a while uh, a while yeah. back, he's, you know, basically what we're doing is yeah. we're putting words in the mouth of Tolkien's idea of God. And I don't feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. So, <laughs> what else is there? How, how well, else? we can put we can put words in the mouths of the Valar, though. Yeah. So if 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 we show yeah. Melkor leave and go off into the void, mm -hmm. like we don't necessarily know what he's doing or why he did that, except yeah. we we got the impression he's yeah. uncomfortable, so he's leaving. We got that. Yeah. Then when he comes yeah. back, one of the others can ask him, "Where did you go? What were you doing?" And he can yeah. say, "I'm I'm looking for something that's not here." Or that I can, you know, and he can start explaining it. And they're like, "Well, what do you mean it's not here? Everything is here." It's like, "No, no, yeah. there's, there's, yeah. there's something that, mm -hmm. um, something you know, gets a spark to life." And like, you know, he can have the station where he brings yeah. up the idea of the flame imperishable without naming it, mm -hmm. as he's trying to describe what it is he's looking for and longing for. And depending on who he has that conversation with. Cool. Their reaction to that could be Delito. enlightening, because Varda should be the one most likely to know what that is. Like she's got the light of the Luvatar in her face, right? Yeah, okay. she's the, the one part of a Luvatar yeah. she understands is likely the flame of <laughs> yeah. Like that's okay. her part. <laughs> yeah. So um, she could start expressing the "What do you mean it's not here?" idea if it's her that okay. she, that he's interacting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and she could. And I think it works to have. <laughs> it's gonna happen. I think it works to have Melkor wandering off, um, 
after feeling uncomfortable or feeling frustrated at not being part of, not being able to take his rightful place as leader, if he wanders off just out of frustration and then has this sort of moment where he realizes there's something elusive, some kind of, ah, that's, this is my part now. I'm going to be the one to find the flame imperishable. I have some kind of need to discover it. It can be his new mission. Right, okay. And something that says- Which creeps Varda out. And something that makes him more important than everybody else who doesn't understand. Like we need to set up, I mean, so much of his character is his pride and you can do that in a very sympathetic way of like, oh, that's so going to get you in trouble, dude. <laughs> but but it needs to be yeah. and like very unabashed at this point. He's not hiding his superiority. Yeah. Because he knows he's yeah. more than these other little peons. Mm-hmm. He knows he's the best. So right. I, yeah. At what point does he come back and try to get Varda to come back, come out with him into the void? Do we think that he has a conversation with her, goes back out into the void, comes back, talks to her again, and... Something would have to happen in the void the second time. Okay. And there's, it's the void. Like, what happens yeah. in the there's void? There's nothing out there. <laughs> Except possibly Ungoliant. We have well, mentioned that, that Ungoliant... Yeah, that was kind of possibly. <laughs> that he could run into her out there. Um... <laughs> But what? But how would that go down? What would happen there? Right, that interaction wouldn't, because I mean, if Melkor doesn't understand what everybody's on about with this whole "let's sing together" thing, mm-hmm. and Golian would be the last person to understand what that's about. Like, okay. <laughs> what if? What if he's the one who? Maybe he tells her about the flame, what he thinks about the flame imperishable. Mm. And, he, and, she, he, and she just really What would her reaction be? Well, I mean, what would Ungoliant's reaction be to, the, to hearing about the flame imperishable other than, I want to eat it. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I'm hungry. Yeah. Um, is it lunchtime? Because I'm starving. That is terrifying. Never do that again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love Ungoliant as a character. She is yeah. one of the most striking, interesting, weird, terrifying Tolkien creations out there, I think. So I'm really excited mm-hmm. about the idea of getting to know her in her non spider eating everything form. Yeah. So, okay. If that shows through a little bit, mm-hmm. I apologize. <laughs> but no, it's good because she's a weird enough character that it's hard to uh, understand her point of view. She's- so if you. Right. You like her, you're much more likely to be like, here's what she's about. This is what she's going to do in that situation. Okay. Yeah. So, she I mean, has an edge of crazy that I like. Right. right. So, may, I mean, maybe that's what we need to do then. Maybe we need to, to have Melkor run across her, and maybe he's not entirely comfortable that there's somebody else out there. Mm. Um, so he can challenge her and be suspicious, like, what are you doing here? And she's like, oh, right. this is where I am. What's... Okay. I, I like it here. Yeah. I'm here. It's it's nice. It's quiet, or it was before you got yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And maybe have some sort of, conf- not a confrontation per se, but have a definite <sighs> level of antagonism between them. Ungoliant's never met anyone before. She's always been alone. Yeah. She didn't know there was anything else out there in the world. Okay. And Ungoliant's yeah. reaction to finding out that there's more things out there in the world is, I want that. Uh-huh. I'm a- Imagine yeah. if the I first person you ever met was Melkor. I mean, <laughs> yeah. That's like, this is going to explain that. her hang up, too. Like, this is great. Yeah. No this wonder has- she is <laughs> so interesting. She's the first yeah. person creature being she's ever met is you know Melkor. it's good stuff right and if he and if he does tell her if he does fess up and tell her that he's out there looking for looking for the flame imperishable Mm -hmm. that's going to start her desire for the light 
uh, yeah. which might be why she arrives in in Arda. Mm-hmm. You know, she comes to Arda because there's light there. Yeah, like we should yeah. see, yeah. like as he's talking, just her eyes just light up with this idea of like, mm-hmm. oh. Yeah, and so and she's uh, associated with delicious. light and fire. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think we can get some vibe in there of, you know, foretelling of her trying to eat him. Um, mm-hmm. Some kind of subtle cue, maybe just by body language, but uh, they, these two as characters are very interesting when talking to each other and facing each other because they're very different in what, how they go about things and in the end goal, but they have desire in common. They just voraciously right. want something, be that domination or just to consume it. She doesn't want to be in charge. She doesn't right. want to be worshipped. She just wants to soak everything she wants in. everything and, and to be a part of herself. Right. Yes. yes. And he More doesn't want time. to absorb. Well, but he takes he that idea. Rule. He decides that the way he's going to control Arda is put his own force and power into it so that he can control the whole world. So he's kind yeah. of taking her vibe of, well, everything will be mine if I eat it and say like, well, everything will be mine if I put myself into it. So it's it's like an inversion of her idea, but there's a connection there. And if, if we're going to show her getting the idea of hunger and desiring other from his conversation with the climate perishable, then he should be getting something from her as well of realizing yeah. that yeah that you can interact with people in a way that's not what he's done so far because like she should have a very femme fatale thing going on with like don't trust this person but she's still like you know getting a little too close to him (laughs) and it's like oh you don't get right in the face (laughs) smiles with too many teeth kind of right right you could get a line about I'm starving. A line about what? Uh, being starving. Are you hungry? <laughs> I'm so yeah. hungry. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, what's hungry? I'm a disembodied creature who has never known what it <laughs> is like to need food. What is this hungry of which you speak? Um, yeah, which kind of destroys yeah. that little vibe right there. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Yeah, we but need I like to, the well, idea. That could, be, that could be a great way to end their interaction where, like, she says, are you hungry? I'm hungry. And 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 he's just like, <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I'm leaving. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so his first trip into the void, he's alone and nothing happens. But when he comes back, he admits what he was doing there, was searching. The second trip into right. the void, yeah. he meets her and their interaction reveals a little bit more what he thinks about the slime imperishable and he mm-hmm. he does kind of flee her like he he might not admit that afterwards but right. he yeah. freaks him out enough that he gets out of there so right. when he returns to the timeless halls this time he's fleeing the void not just returning from the void maybe yeah. this is why he wants varda to come out with him right she's protected <laughs> Light. I'm afraid of the dark. You're light. <laughs> like, uh, so, you know, Ungoliant is, you know, is the absence of light. Mm-hmm. And Varda is light. You know, so she's yeah. kind of like a like a countermeasure. Yeah. So Varda's going to turn him down, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. Well, I wasn't sure if it was going to be an instant shot down or a well, entertain the idea and then say... But no, I, I wasn't sure. Well, I would say, I, I mean, I think they kind of discussed this a little bit as well, where they they felt, the host felt, that have her kind of, kind of entertain the notion. Right, because this is supposed to set up a love triangle, not between Angolian Varda and Melkor, but between Melkor Varda and Manway. Well, I mean, I don't yeah. know about a love triangle, but it, were- it is supposed to set up some kind of you know that there there could have been a relationship there that wasn't right it was it's supposed to be a what could have been so we need to show varda have at least some initial rapport with him yeah that isn't like a aon worm tongue 
kind of thing where it's like, a, yeah, that will never work. This is not in the realm of possibility. It's more a, oh, yeah, that could work if he wasn't a power hungry demagogue kind of character. Uh, and and that should be clear by the end of this that Varda sees through him and wants nothing to do with him. Yeah. So she doesn't have to start there, but she does need to end up there. Yeah. Real quick.